uh, we are looking at an interesting situation. The, the global economy, particularly the emerging market part of it, is in some turmoil. Uh, economies, particularly the large ones like China, are slowing down. Let's try and understand how this impacts us. And before trying to understand how this impacts a country like India, let's go a little uh, uh, deeper and try and understand how it impacts a state like Orissa or maybe even your constituency. And is there some connection between that part of the world and what's happening elsewhere? Yes, you know, the largest part of the turmoil mm. is in the most basic part of China's economy, mm. uh, the traditional part. So it has to do with uh, metals, steel, minerals, and all of that are relevant to the eastern part of India, not just Odisha, but mm. states like Jharkhand, states like Chhattisgarh. Now, these are the states over the last dozen or 15 years, mm. they have outperformed the rest of India. Mm. These used to be the so-called basket cases for many decades, but in the last uh, many years, mm they have outperformed and a large part of that uh, very good solid economic performance of nearly double digit or many years more than double digit growth was uh, because of industries like steel and mining. Now we've both had internal challenges as you know many mines were shut down mm. uh, but there is a Supreme Court order now asking some of them to reopen. Mm. But the Chinese impact is very severe mm. because a lot of India's the unprocessed ores mm. get exported to countries like China mm. and they get processed more efficiently and mm. they come back to India as finished products like steel. Mm. So we get hit on both sides. Uh, we have to have greater internal productivity. We have to have greater internal um, efficiencies mm. uh, so that it should not be possible for raw material to make the round trip to China and come back cheaper uh, to India than what we can produce ourselves. Mm. So for that, we need to face up to the policy challenges necessary. Uh, a lot has happened in recent months in untangling some of the red tape and some of the hurdles internally in the country, but a lot more needs to happen. Right. So which way should that go? So one is to say that, yes, as you say, which is almost theoretical now, saying that we should be a more productive economy, we should create more capacity, which is obviously of larger scale, and therefore try and beat the, uh, you know, beat the Chinese at their own game. But that, in some ways, is a train that's left the station already, isn't it? Well, yes, over the last 35 years, mm. China has China's economy has gone from being about on par with India mm. to five or six times larger. Mm. And, you know, it's not rocket science. They, they followed classical free market uh, policies, which is what has led to this. And we are stuck uh, in a decades-old mindset where, for example, we still can't get GST through. Mm. Now, if we can't get GST through, let us recognize that we are not one market domestically. Mm. So the comparison to China is very odious. Mm. So these are some of the things that You're we need to... almost like 29 markets competing with one big country. Precisely. Yeah. It, you know, it's like Laos competing with China mm. or an Odisha competing with China rather than the entire Indian economy, which is very substantial even if it is much smaller than China. So we have to get a lot of these internal hurdles out of the way. Uh, otherwise, we will miss the bus again. I don't think we have missed the bus, but, mm. uh, you know, we, we, we do risk that now. So where would be, I mean, since we, let's talk about the policy side. Pa part of this is to do with, obviously, with private investment, the, the freedom to make that investment easily, and the hurdles that may or may not come in the way of doing that. But let's look at what could be done or needs to be done somewhat urgently on the policy side. Well, you, you know, we understand that uh, issues like GST are stuck because of the parliamentary uh, gridlock. Mm. Uh, the government doesn't have the numbers in the Rajya Sabha, and, and that's that, really. But there are lots of things that can be done that don't require legislation or those where legislation is not uh, gridlocked. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the first half of the budget session was quite productive actually. Mm -hmm. We got the Aadhaar bill through, we got the bankruptcy bill through. Mm -hmm. So I think these are building blocks which will all contribute to the more competitive economy that we are seeking. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, executive actions, the things that the government can do virtually with the stroke of a pen, mm -hmm. uh, these fall into two categories, what the central government can do and what states can do. Now, you've recently heard about Rajasthan mm. uh, taking some very progressive steps. Just, I think, yesterday, it was in the news for the new land title mm. law that it passed. Mm. These, uh, these ought to be emulated by other states, mm. and I think this uh, uh, federalism will lead to states competing and, and mm. improving their laws on some of these issues. Um, uh, but the central government, the union government, can also do many things. Uh, in terms of removing hurdles on FDI. There are still hurdles on FDI coming in. Uh, there are still hurdles on, uh, you know, just for can this. Can you illustrate one sort of hurdle? Uh, there are still sectoral caps. Mm -hmm. Now, a few months ago, uh, I think uh, when the government was about a year into its tenure, mm -hmm. it uh, relaxed the sectoral caps 
on a lot of the uh, sectors where FDI uh, had been limited and it was opened up. But they could have done that on the first day. Mm. And they can do that today on a lot of other sectors where there is no uh, you know, uh, geostrategic issue involved. Mm. Um, so uh, government can do lots. Mm. Uh, and, and I think it is trying on some fronts. If I were to ask you uh, for the sort of 2016-17 prognosis and outlook, I mean, in general, I mean, from what we've spoken about so far, what's your sense? I mean, you know, obviously there's despondency despite the kind of GDP numbers we're seeing, and everyone knows that, and I think everyone has different views on that. But what's your own sense, and do you see things looking up, uh, maybe uh, perceptionally, if not uh, on ground? You know, at this very conference, mm. a very important international public figure mm. spoke yesterday and said that we Indians often just highlight the negatives much more mm. than the positive. If you look at the sentiment about India and the rest of the world, mm. it is far more positive sure. than what we sense sure. if we read sure. the Indian media, mm. if we talk to a lot of Indian opinion makers. And uh, I think we need to change that, first of all. Secondly, uh, yes, uh, expectations had been very high about sweeping changes, and those sweeping changes are taking time because of parliamentary gridlock and things that we've talked about already. Uh, I see the glass as half full. I think lots of good things are happening. We've, in this conversation, touched upon maybe right. half a dozen mm. things that are happening. I think the effects of these building blocks, as it were, we will start, we are already beginning to start feeling some of the effects. Mm. I mean, the China plateauing and some of the internal restructuring, which is gradually taking us up the ladder mm. in, for example, the ease of doing business index. Uh, the World Economic Forum has one, the World Bank has one. But we are making incremental improvement. We need to improve in leaps and bounds. Mm. But whatever changes have been happening, mm. I think we have seen so far only in GDP growth numbers. But we are going to see, I believe, in the next couple of years, a lot more ramifications, good ones, mm -hmm. because of the building blocks that are being put into place now. I mean, this is really if someone in your constituency walks up to you and asks you, uh, are we living in a more globalized world? Uh, is it going to get more globalized or less globalized? And how could that affect things? We are clearly living in a much more globalized world. We can go to the remotest corners of Kendrapara, mm. which in my mm, constituency, yeah. which is very rural, or you go anywhere, even in uh, really remote Odisha like Koraput or Kalahandi, you'll be very uh, impressed to see something. You get fruits available in villages that have come all the way from China. all over the world, from, mm. from New Zealand and from Afghanistan mm. uh, and the rest of India. Uh, whereas in just a generation ago, it was simply impossible to find any decent fruits. Mm. So there is a supply chain that has come into place, obviously, even though we lack uh, cold storage facilities and all of that. Uh, yes, globalization, uh, we, we still send a large number of people, uh, such as plumbers, from Kendrapara to the Middle East and to the rest of the country. Uh, yes, we are living in a much more globalized era. Uh, it has both opportunities for us, such mm. as job opportunities elsewhere, uh, but it also has threats to us mm. because you also see very low-priced Chinese goods, uh, plastic items and toys being sold in rural areas, which really the Indian economy should have been capable of creating uh, manufacturers for. But we've been stuck in, uh, in not allowing the small-scale sector to grow up, mm. uh, in, in putting hurdles in the path of those enterprises which employ more people. So as a result, uh, globalization in some areas it gives us cheap products, but also, I think, impacts our own competitiveness.